right, so we're going to do a little case study on Somalia um, for this lecture. And so just a little bit of background information. Uh, the superpower rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War left Somalia a pretty devastated nation. It had a ruler. This is the gentleman, Mohammed Saeed Bari, had maintained some semblance of order in that country supplied first uh, by the Soviet Union and then the United States. Um, they supplied arms that let, let him kind of hold things together for about 21 years. And so similar to the situation in the former Yugoslavia, where you had different ethnic groups um, being held together by Tito, in Somalia you had different groups being held together by Mohammed Saeed. But in 1991, he was forced by opposing clans to flee the capital of Mogadishu, taking refuge in his home uh, region in the western part of Somalia. And so what followed was armed anarchy as various rebel forces fought for control of the capital. It was a clan feud, okay? A fight for power by forces armed with a wide array of U.S. and Soviet weapons left over from the Cold War. And so Somalia quickly became an utterly lawless and um, an utterly lawless land filled with savage fighting, fear, looting, and starvation. Jeeps roamed the streets of Mogadishu, mounted with rifles manned by teenage soldiers. In a three-month period, at the end of 1991, an estimated 25,000 people, mostly civilians were killed or wounded in the fighting, and a quarter of a million residents of the capital were forced to flee the city. So what you have is a situation where you've got ethnic conflict, clan conflict occurring, civilians dying because of the war, and then you have a refugee situation. So the combination of drought and warfare produced a famine, and a famine as severe as any in modern times. Okay, so again, the next, this is a picture of Mogadishu before the fighting, and so he's reforced to clear out of Mogadishu in 1991. All right, so then you have two groups. Ali Mahdi is the leader of one group, and then Mohammed Faid uh, for our ID is the other. And again, three months, uh, lots of, of, of in, uh, people killed and wounded. But what you also have is a decimation of the agricultural sector of the economy. So non-governmental relief agencies such as the Red Cross uh, and Save the Children managed to deliver thousands of tons of food a day, but many interior er areas of Somalia and even some sections of Mogadishu were beyond reach. All right, So you have starvation, refugees, and very quickly the world is being shown photos in, uh, of starving, starving individuals in Somalia. Starving people, uh, you have warring forces block shipments of relief food from reaching the starving people and they ended up stealing this food. In mid-1992, the UN Security Council sent emergency food airlifts into Somalia uh, protected by a token force of about 500 armed guards. The UN relief missions fre frequently came under armed attack at the airport outside the capital. At the, outside the capital, and ships that were laden with UN relief food were denied permission to unload at the docks. All right. So finally, in 1992, the UN sanctioned a request from U.S. President George Bush to send a military operation led by 28,000 troops to ensure the distribution of international food, medicine, and supplies. So in 1992, we start to have this international response. Again, through NGOs, this is part of the human rights regime, Red Cross, Save the Children, but they can't deliver the food, particularly to the interior of the country. In July, UN military observers are sent as part of a ceasefire agreement. This is UNISOM 1, all right? The Operation UNISOM 1, Operation Provide Relief, okay? It was uh, somewhat successful, all right, um, uh, but not for the long term. So in terms of hu humanitarian relief, the success, the success is very limited to just the regions that that relief can get to. 
So the UN is unable to deliver food and supplies to the most needy. Relief flights into Somalia were often looted as they landed. So it was very quickly that the UN turns to the United States. All right. So George Bush agrees to send U.S. troops. This is Unified Task Force, okay, often referred to as uh, Operation Restore Hope. All right. U.S. troops are going to ensure the distribution of international food, medicine, and supplies. And by the time the world, uh, by the time the world's largest armed humanitarian rescue mission was launched, there was an estimated 300,000 Somalis had died already of starvation, and as many as one third of the six million people of Somalia were in danger of death by starvation. All right, so the UN troops take over the mission, and this is when it becomes UNISOM II. Okay. After the first U.S. Marines had landed, a disagreement developed between George Bush and the UN General Secretary Boutros Boutros Ghali over the nature of the mission. Bush envisioned a purely humanitarian mission of short duration. Boutros Boutros Ghali however, proclaimed a larger mission to disarm the Somali warlords and establish political stability in the country. The new U.S. President, Bill Clinton, accepted this expanded mission to eliminate the primary source of mayhem and famine in Somalia. Initially, the U.S.-led intervention in Somalia was an admirable success, making possible the delivery of life-saving food to hundreds of thousands of people. But this achievement was soon overshadowed by military failure. Even as UN forces from various nations replaced US troops, Clinton authorized US soldiers to engage in a manhunt for the Somalian warlord considered the person most responsible for the continued violence, and this is General Mohammed Farah Adid. His capture was deemed all the more important after his troops ambushed and killed 24 Pakistani troops, uh, I'm sorry, Pakistani UN soldiers in June 1993. Um, okay, this should be uh, June 1993. I'm not sure why it says 2003, so I apologize for that. Um, so, by June 1993, you only have 1,200 troops remain, okay? And so, that seems successful. This larger mission of capturing warlords starting in June 1993 starts the path down to disaster. Um, what happens is the UN re is putting out a reward for capturing those responsible, uh, Adid and his followers, so they're offering a $25,000 reward or a bounty on his head. Meanwhile, opposition to the extended military in Operation Somalia was mounting in Washington, and this opposition became a furor several months later when an unsuccessful U.S. attack on Adid headquarters led to a furious day-long firefight that left 18 U.S. soldiers dead and 84 wounded. Worst yet was a spectacle of Adid's troops dragging the corpses of U.S. soldiers throughout the streets of Mogadishu. This is the episode that we know as Black Hawk Down. The Clinton administration quickly decided to cut its losses, and instead of fighting a deed, the U.S. accepted him as a political leader. Uh, peace and political order remained elusive. We still, there's still sporadic um, warfare between Adid's clan and various rival clans. Uh, in the end, the operation, which cost over $2 billion, 30% of which was borne by the U.S., and hundreds of cal casualties, was a political failure. But the operation, coupled with a plentiful harvest in 1994, did bring an end to the famine and save hundreds of thousands of lives. So what you have is many, uh, and if you've seen the movie, and if you've seen the uh, uh, documentaries on TV, many Somalians are murdered. Um, of course, we, the U.S. lost 18 soldiers and had uh, many more wounded. Um, but what you end up having is the U.S. completely uh, leaving Somalia. In the meantime, Adid dies in 1995 from a gunshot wound. Ironically, his son is a former U.S. Marine who was in the Gulf War uh, and educated in California, educated in the United States, was a businessman for a while, 
moves back to Somalia and takes over the Klan leadership after his father dies. The UN leaves Somalia in 1995. Um, so how do we end up evaluating the events in Somalia? Um, the appraisals vi uh, vary, you know, widely um, in terms of, of uh, what happened. It was disparaged as a media-driven spectacle of misguided in, in internationalism. Uh, I'm sorry. It was disparaged as a media-driven spectacle of misguided internationalism that ignored the pitfalls of intervention. Um, and so this pretty much set the stage for the next case of what we're going to find out about the Rwandan genocide. And this made the United States very gun-shy of, of getting involved in situations abroad that many people in the United States felt the United, that, that, that the United States had no business getting involved in. Okay. So if we think of it as a blueprint for Somalia, is you don't want to overreach. You don't want to mix your humanitarian mission with a political mission. And so the humanitarian aspect of the Somali operation uh, was a success, but once it became a political mission, that's when disaster hit. Some blame the Somalia operation for sapping U.S. political will and global standing and for inhibiting Americans from doing the right thing in places like Rwanda and then like Bosnia that we just talked about in the previous episode, uh, previous lecture. Other schools uh, of thought view it as some sort of criticism for multilateralism and an object lesson on the UN's inadequacy and the need to limit the U.S. role in UN peacekeeping. And so the question becomes, is it an appropriate use of power? Is it balanced? The U.S. led, but 20, yet 24 countries participated in the relief mission, as well as the after effect of U.S. involvement. But th but the lion's share, again, is the United States leading the charge. So ultimately there is um, a lesson here that there's no such thing as a purely humanitarian intervention, that there's always going to be consequences. And some see this as a step toward a new era in American foreign policy and humanitarian leadership, which only turned sour because the United States became entangled in local politics, that is, the local politics of Somalia. The intervention in Somalia was not a failure as measured by the standards first set by President Bush, however. Much has been accomplished in humanitarian terms, and a larger tragedy had been averted in the human rights area. How large a tragedy is impossible to know, but judging by the Somalia death toll of 1992, one could reasonably estimate that upwards of a quarter of a million Somali lives were saved because of the humanitarian intervention to stop the famine. At the at the strategic level, Somalia raises questions of limits to and criteria for U.S. and U.N. involvement in humanitarian operations, political transitions from protracted civil conflicts, as well as efforts to restore failed states. So again, I think the big lesson here is whether to deal with humanitarian intervention, but those things are going to have a consequence, and the idea here is not to overreach. But in this case, we had success in ending one human rights tragedy, the famine, but it led to other tragedies uh, associated with human rights in terms of the lost life due to conflict and warfare. All right, we'll move on to the Rwandan genocide in the third lecture.